Okay, now we are. Thank you, Yoli. I appreciate that. <clears throat> I always forget that. So um, let's see. So the approved budget is also part of your grant agreement. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how to modify that um, uh, in a minute. I've got a separate slide for that. So here are your milestones um, for this year, for this cycle, um, the coming fiscal year. So one I want to highlight to you is the second bullet. Um, based on some changes that we're going to be uh, implementing that come out of your feedback to us, uh, we have to make some minor changes to the procedures and requirements document. Um, and unfortunately, um, our lawyer won't allow me to do that without doing an amended grant agreement. So sometime in July or August, we're going to have to go through the um, grant signature process again. And while that's a little bit of a pain, I think you're going to agree when you see the changes that we're um, putting into place that uh, it'll be worth it. So what we will be sending out is a an amended uh, procedures and requirements document. It'll show the language that we're striking uh, as strike through, and it will show any language that we're adding as underlined. Um, you'll be receiving that about the same time that you get the um, the amended uh, or the new grant cover sheet that'll be routed through Adobe Sign in the same way uh, as before for signature. Now, since you already have, have a resolution in place and a designated signatory, then it only needs to be signed by that designated signatory and we're done. So hopefully uh, this does not mean that you need a, a different, any board approval or anything like that. Um, it's just an amendment to it, to the agreement that they've already signed. Uh, so this um, performance period will end next June 29th, and the final date for invoices and progress reports will be September 30th. Of course, mid-years are always due um, in February, and uh, the, um, the invoicing periods don't change. So your budget categories you're familiar with, the caps are there. Um, we'll be sending out this, uh, this document later to you. Uh, so you'll have this, uh, this whole PowerPoint deck in a PDF. So these will be there for you, but you're all familiar with those. Budget modifications. So um, you need to request budget modifications in writing from your grant manager. And when you email them, you will need to communicate three pieces of information in that email. A justification. So why do you need to move the money? Maybe you've got more inspections to do and you want to move money from training into inspections. Where are you moving it from and where are you moving it to? So you, you're going to say we're moving uh, $1,000 from training to inspections. And so be specific about the amounts and the categories that you're moving money between. Grant manager will reply with either approval or questions. Um, usually it's just an approval process. And um, upon approval, the grant manager will adjust the budget for you in GMS. You don't need to do that. They will, they will do that for you. The only thing that you'll need to do is um, adjust your EIS um, on your side to uh, make sure that you ref you've reflected the, the change in your budget. So administrative costs. This, uh, this is anything that you're paying somebody to do to implement the grant activities at an administrative level. So progress reports and payment requests fall under this umbrella and the rest of those bullets. So you can charge internal meetings related to T, unless it's training, then it would go to training, administrative supervision and evaluation of T staff, development of the next cycle application is also 
um, chargeable under this category. So education is education that you are doing for external stakeholders. So waste tar generators, waste tar haulers. Um, if you are going out to, to a brand new TPID number and giving them education about how to properly uh, follow the rules, then that, that would be chargeable under here. You can also charge costs for printing and distributing cow recycle brochures. Now we don't support uh, printing costs, um, publication costs for anything other than the cow recycle brochure. That's, that's the limitation. Okay. You, oh, the last? There yes. was a question. Okay. Can you read that to me? Yes. Can we include pre-inspection report review and inventory activities in admin count category? So, Pre activities for an inspection. Pre inspection report review and inventory activities in admin category. Okay, it sounds like two different things. So the pre inspection should be charged under inspection. Right. If they're inventorying uh, equipment or things like that, then I think that would fall under admin. Okay. But if it's, if it's some other kind of inventory, um, please specify in the chat and we'll, we'll address that. The next question is, do we get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. We'll, we'll email that out to everybody after this uh, event is over. Thank you. Keep going. All right. Enforcement. So, uh, Conducting and reporting on investigations, researching, identifying, and documenting illegal sites, and a whole list of other um, things. Uh, please, please note that um, Cow Recycle is pretty strict about cleanup of tire piles on private property. Um, so anything with greater than 500 tires illegally stored must be referred to Cal Recycle prior to seeking remediation. So please refer those uh, instances to your Cal Recycle liaison. But you can, you can charge us for enforcement for obviously for surveillance, for uh, field patrolling activities. Um, you can set up cameras for surveillance, uh, coordinate with other agencies like the CHP or the DA. Um, there's a whole bunch of things here that you can charge us for under, under this category. So under field patrolling and a small tire pile cleanup, um, eligible activities and costs include time to prepare and plan your field patrol, time spent to follow up on illegal dumping complaints and referrals, cleanup of small tire piles with 35 or less tires on public land, including disposal fees. So we support all of those things. And we've had um, at least one grantee that uh, they purchased a lift gate for a truck um, for a pickup so that when they go out uh, on field patrol and they find some tires, that their, their staff isn't having to hoist those up into the back of the pickup. Um, some of those truck tires get really heavy. So um, that kind of thing we can support. Um, we do request if you're going to purchase a piece of equipment that is um, $5,000 or more that you, and I think the lift gate was, that you um, get three bids and submit those with the um, invoice so that we're, we're able to see that, that you got the best price. And you are required to take the lowest price. So. Um, Please, please do diligence on that. Um, Derek, we have another question. Okay. I have a case where we thought the tires were less than 500, but as we remove more tire, but as we remove more tires come out over 500, what do we do in those cases? So they thought it was 500, but it ended up being more than 500. What, what do we do in those cases? Well, I think... At that point, you're going to just continue the cleanup, but you should also at that point notify your Cal Recycle liaison that, hey, you know, 
this this turned out to be a lot bigger than we thought. Sometimes that happens, you know. It, sometimes the tires are embedded and and you just can't see until you start pulling them out how many are in there. So do uh, do communicate with your calorie cycle liaison because they may they may want to do a little investigation about you know about that property. So okay, good question. Uh, for this category, either T staff does the cleanup of waste tires, or how about contracting a hauler? Um, well, uh, under the T grant, you're not you're not really able to pay for removal of more than 35 tires. We've limited this. Uh, we've li we've limited it this way because what we were finding in the past is that as people did field patrol, they would identify tires, but since they weren't paid to pick them up and dispose of them, they would then have to refer it to their maintenance folks who would then have to go back out and pick up the tires and dispose of them. So it was a, a big waste of, of jurisdiction's money to spend, to have two trips. So if you find the, a waste tire pile with 35 or more, then uh, there are cow recycle grants for, you know, that your jurisdiction can apply for, for waste tire cleanup. Um, I know that, you know, uh, jurisdictions with a local conservation court close by can call on them uh, to assist with uh, waste tire piles, uh, removal and hauling. They're all, they're all haulers, uh, registered haulers. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you wouldn't be able to pay for a hauler for under this grant um, in all likelihood, unless it was unless it was a 30, 30 um, tire pile, that would that would be okay if that was necessary. Okay. Any others? No. Okay, thank you. Operational costs. Um, so this is a broader category than we used to have. We used to call it equipment. Um, so the, the only thing I really want to point out here is that um, if you buy something, a piece of equipment that costs $500 or more, then you do need to provide an invoice and proof of payment. Now, with a jurisdiction, you can, you can provide uh, a ledger entry from your accounting department showing that that, that cost was entered into the accounting system and that's perfectly fine we're not looking for a a check copy or anything like that necessarily so um, five hundred dollars or more um, proof of payment and invoice uh, as backup and um, also remember that if you're buying something uh, say a phone for a, a inspector if they're 100% T, it's okay to charge us 100% of that cost. But if they are split over, say, two programs, and they're spending an equal amount of time, and that phone is used in both programs, then you should only be charging us 50% of the cost, not the whole cost. Okay. Indirect. So this, this. Uh, category causes a lot of gnashing of teeth, <clears throat> but it's it's a it's a good it's a good way for your jurisdiction to recoup some of the costs that are um, that are borne by your your agency to implement the program. So we do have a 20% cap of this. So <clears throat> you take your direct costs and multiply by 20%, and that tells you your your cap for indirect. So all grantees must employ an indirect cost rate that conforms to generally accepted accounting principles. That's why we ask that you get your cost allocation plan from your accounting department because they know how to, how to properly calculate those costs. Um, and they have, the cost charge have to be uh, consistent with your agency's indirect cost practices and align with your cap that you submitted with your application. So I have an example here. 
Um, sometimes there's some confusion about how to charge this, how much you can charge. Some people um, misunderstand the 20% to mean that on an invoice, you can only charge 20% of the invoice to indirect. But let me show you an example. So an agency's T grant budget, this is just a fictitious example, but has direct costs budgeted at $100,000. Indirect then can be budgeted at 20. So the total grant budget would be $120,000. So on the mid year invoice down there on the left, if the first invoice shows direct costs of $34,000 and the actual agency indirect cost rate is 43%, the agency may charge up to $14,620 for indirect costs on that invoice. So 43% times the 34,000. So on the final invoice now, so if the agency charged 14,620 on the first invoice per the 43%, there's now a $5,380 balance left on the indirect budget line item to charge on the final invoice. So even though the indirect cost rate may be 43%, you can't charge more than 5,380 on the final invoice because your total cap amount was $20,000. So hopefully that, that explains a little bit about how this should be charged. Your, your agency uh, accounting department can help you calculate your indirect um, on your invoice um, if you're not sure about how that should be done. So, so inspections, that's the primary uh, work of the grant, of course, um, has to be performed. All inspections must be performed in compliance with the Cow Recycle Inspection Manual. And um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but if you need training on inspections, you have new inspectors, then uh, you can either get permission from your cow recycle liaison to train them yourself, or you can ask your cow recycle liaison to come and provide that training. Uh, but cow recycle wants to be sure that everybody gets um, a sort of a standard uh, training regimen here. So we are we are tracking time by inspection. Um, on T28, and we're we're doing an analysis of that to see um, what that what the hours per inspection look like across all grantees, um, and we'll we'll be coming back to you in the fall with some reporting on that. Training. So, wait, wait, wait. yes, if the liaison provides a list of the SQG. Are we to complete 100%? that list as compared to the priority. What, what is CQG again? Small quantity generator. SQG, yeah. So um, if I understand the question that the SQG list is separate from the priority inspection list, <clears throat> my understanding from enforcement is that you are to focus first on your priority inspection list and then inspect uh, new TPIDs, which are always classified as SQG unless, un, until they're inspected and shown to have higher uh, tire count than an SQG. Um, small, quantity, uh, small quantity generators you, that have been inspected previously can be reinspected with permission from the liaison, um, but uh, I'm not sure if that answered the, the question in its entirety. If not, could you just restate the question in the chat, and we'll we'll tr try another another uh, another answer. I think you got it. I think that was good. Okay, thanks. All right, so. Um, we do list some trainings uh, that are mandatory uh, and some non-mandatory that you can charge um, without you know, 
asking for permission from your grant manager to expend that money. If you want to send an inspector or staff member to an applicable training that's not listed in either mandatory or non-mandatory, then you can reach out to your grant manager, provide information about that training, um, maybe a course description or a syllabus or whatever it is that's available from the trainer and explain why you want to uh, take advantage of that opportunity. And then your grant manager will have a look at it and maybe bounce it off me or, or um, Yoli and uh, we'll, um, we'll get back to you and, and uh, make sure that you got either permission or you know sometimes, sometimes denial, but um, you guys are pretty good at knowing what you need. So just, uh, just make sure that you get permission before you take the training and expend the money. Um, so that you don't run into a problem getting reimbursed. All right, transportation. Um, so you can you can charge us for agency or personal vehicle use, you know, whatever your jurisdiction allows. Um, Cow Recycle doesn't set the state mileage rate. We're um, we're just the piano players. We don't make the music. So. They'll, they'll change that every January. Um, and so the common mistake on second, the second invoice of the year is, is carrying forward the mileage rate from the previous year. So just double check in January um, when you start doing your record keeping um, to see what the mileage rate is. And usually it mirrors the federal uh, mileage rate, the IRS, the IRS or whoever it is at the Fed federal level puts out. <clears throat> so you can either charge us one of two ways. You can charge us for mileage, um, the state rate or the grantees rate, whichever is less. And that would cover everything that's listed in item two. The mileage rate is intended to be an umbrella charge for use of vehicles. You can also charge us itemized transportation costs if you so choose. Um, I don't believe anybody chooses to do that. It's a lot of work, um, but you you may if, if that's uh, advantageous to your agency. All right, so I am going to turn this over to Yoli and um, I am going to mute. Thank you, Derek. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. I am Yoli Park. I am the T program lead, and I'm going to go over the payment requests, and then later we'll go over evaluations for the T program. Slide. Some of you may remember this slide from our T admin roundtables. And during those meetings, we discussed the first four items you see here. And the fifth item, we were able to get enforcement's help. By now, we've addressed some issues with the purple arrow, such as indirect. And others will be addressed throughout this webinar, such as allocating costs. For this cycle, we've been able to finalize some solutions. And we're going to present those starting with issues one and two, which are shown with the red arrows. Slide. So based on feedback from grantees about the administrative burden of reporting inspection hours by TPID, we are changing how you report inspection hours for reimbursement. You will not be submitting the priority work plan, also known as the inspection log, with your invoice. Instead, you will enter total inspection hours by inspector on the EIS, and that is it. Be aware and be forewarned, however, that when an audit occurs, you will still need to have timesheets that account for each inspector's time, and notes must be associated with that time by TPID. So auditors will test to ensure that inspectors billed during an invoice period were actually doing those inspections during that period. So you will still receive 
the um, priority work plan with the NTP, but you will no longer need to turn it back in to CalRecycle when you are re requesting reimbursement. I have a couple of questions, Yoli. The first one is, so we don't need to total the hours on the work plan. If you want to do that for yourselves, you can, but you will not need to submit it to us uh, when requesting reimbursement. The total hours for each inspector will be on the EIS only. And then I have another question. <clears throat> Please explain further notes needed. So on your notes, when you are um, your own internal records of inspections and doing TPIDs and whatnot, you'll want to keep your own notes that show an auditor which was which TPID was an inspection or a reinspection or anything that relates to that TPID. We had gotten an example, uh, a grantee had given us an example of what they have for their records. And it showed on that example, um, a TPID that showed up, I think at least three times. There were no notes associated with that TPID though. So we, uh, by we, I mean cover cycle and auditors would want to see, okay, that first TPID was um, a routine inspection, but then, you know, the sec, the, there was a notice of violation found. So had to go back a second time, maybe they were closed. And then the third time everything was resolved or it was further uh, referred to power cycle, things like that. We just want clear notes about why you are going to that TPID or what the reasoning was for that. Okay, I have another one. Uh, let me jump in real quick. Um, so, so just, I'm sorry to, to um, contradict you a little bit, Yoli, but oh, no. Go um, ahead. so I think what, what audits told us is what they want to see is um, if, if there is inspection time charged on a timesheet, then there should be a TPID associated with that charge. Um, and as Yoli said, we saw some examples that people provided to us of ways in their systems that they're already doing that. They've got a column for TPIDs or they have a column for notes where they're just uh, entering TPIDs uh, associated with time. So it's, it's not, we're not asking you to change anything in how you're keeping records. You've already been keeping records by TPID. You're, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to aggregate them the way you have been for, for T28 anyway. What, uh, so don't change what you're doing. You've already been doing it. So it, the difference is that we're not asking for it. And we're not asking you to aggregate all those, those hours that are spread over days or weeks into one charge on the inspection log anymore. We don't need that um, anymore. We've, we've gone through all this with legal and with audits. And the way we're asking you to do it is auditable and, and just fine. So. So did you answer the question routine versus reinspection is logged on the inspection report? Why keep separate notes? And does that, does what Derek said help? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. You don't need to, you don't need to do double entry. So if you're keeping that, if you're keeping that information on uh, somewhere else, you don't need to duplicate that anywhere else. Okay, great. Can GMS and WTMS talk to each other? The notes to be documented are on the WTMS inspection report process itself. So the answer is that they don't talk to each other. Um, however, again, if you're already keeping notes in WTMS and an auditor wants to know where those are, then you would point them to WTMS. They have access to that as well. So you, you don't need to duplicate them in, in GMS. Okay, great. Then I have another one. This new process only for T, excuse me, this, 
This new process is only for TEA 29 or also for TEA 28. Yoli, I'll let you take that one. Okay. This process is for T29. This is the T29 grant admin webinar. So, so we are no longer required to tally our total time per inspection. You will total your total hours per inspector on the EIS but not per inspection. Mm -hmm. Hi, can I ask a quick question? This is um, Nancy Bindar, City of San Diego. Hi, Nancy. Hi, so I just have a quick question. So I know you're, um, so the inspectors are ready. So if you're not requiring the, the log to coordinate with the, the inspectors, you know, their hours, you know, or the, whatever they're, they're inspecting. So they already have it on a, on a different system in there. We can't hear you. Oh, okay, that's okay. I'll um, it's my, it's probably my um, my connection. I'll I'll email you. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Okay, we have another question. Will the EIS be for both inspections and field patrol, or will there be separate ones for each activity? The EIS is unchanged, and I'll get more on that a little bit later, but essentially it's unchanged, and so there will be a separate section on the EIS for field patrolling. Okay, thank you, Yoli. That's, that's it for now. Okay. Um, slide, please. So again, the priority inspection work plan, which is also known as the inspection log, it will still be sent to you in the notice to proceed email. And those emails will be going out today. Some of you may have already received them. Some of you will receive them after this webinar. It's for your planning and for your reference in carrying out the T inspections. And again, you do not need to submit it with the invoice. Slide, please. All right, we'd like to get a quick bit of feedback from you. If you could take a moment and we have this poll. Well, removing the inspection log from the invoice backup, reduce the admin time you need for T. I have a couple more questions too while we're waiting for responses. Does the WTMS logging suffice for audit inspection purposes? I'm going to hand that one to Derek. Sorry, can you can you repeat it? <clears throat> Does the WTMS logging suffice for audit inspection purposes? Well, it depends. I guess it depends on what the auditor is asking. It, it would certainly suffice if if they were trying. What they what they may want to match is um, the the say an inspection of a TPID in October, and they may want they may say to you, "Hey, okay, you you said you did this." Uh, or, or a charge in October for a TPID, and they'll go to WTMS and check to see if that um, if that TPID was actually inspected in October or not. So they may they may do that kind of uh, back and forth to check just to double check the uh, the accuracy of the time accounting. Okay, and then for TEA twenty eight, will we still submitting the work plan yes for t28 please do submit the work plan as it is still part of the procedures and requirements for t28 uh, again earlier derek had talked about that this new process will require a revised procedures and requirements and an amended grants agreement and that will happen uh, later probably in July or so. 
So yes, please do submit for T28 and then that will be the last time. Okay. Thanks, Yoli. That's it for now. Derek, are we doing on the poll? Well, it looks like um, there's some uncertainty about whether this will be easier. Um, I think uh, it, it, uh, it will be, um, I, th I think it will be. <laughs> looks like 41% uh, of the people think it will be and 6% don't think it'll ease anything. Um, not sure 53%. Um, but based on the feedback we got in the three meetings um, and our survey, um, we felt that this would this would ease some of the uh, admin burden when applying for reimbursement or uh, sending us an invoice, preparing that. So hopefully you'll find that it does. Okay, we'll move on. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So grant managers will review WTMS and a report will be pulled from WTMS at the time your invoice is being reviewed to ensure that all inspections completed during the invoice period are marked as eligible for payment. When the grant manager finds that there are any ineligible inspections, they will be reaching out to you to determine whether they were marked in ineligible incorrectly by the liaison or marked correctly as ineligible. So the grant manager will need you to let them know if that ineligible inspection was charged or was not charged to the grant. If it was mistakenly charged to the grant, you will need to provide information about the number of hours charged so that those can be disallowed from the invoice. So a quick recap here then. Grant managers will review WTMS. If everything is marked as eligible, there is no further action needed. If there are any marked as ineligible, grant managers will reach out to you. And if they should be eligible, then you will need to contact your liaison and work with them to make those eligible. If they are correct that they are ineligible, then you will need to let the grant manager know if you charged for it or not. If not, that's fine, then no further action. If you did, then you'll need to let the grant manager know how much to take off to be disallowed. The question, Calor cycle 7674 not required, correct? Off the top of my head, I cannot remember which form that is. Yeah, we're not asking for that form, no. Okay. Thank you, Derek. Any more questions? No, ma'am. Okay. Slide, please. Just kidding. How do we account for attempted inspections that we are unable to complete due to being denied access at the time of the inspection? That will be part of your internal notes that you will need to provide for an auditor. For requesting reimbursement, all your hours will be on the EIS. So if you had hours spent trying to do an inspection but you weren't able to, that still gets wrapped up in your total hours on the EIS. Just charge it to the inspections. Okay, that's all I have for now. All right, um, feedback from grantees also had identified the mileage format as problematic. So in response, we're changing the form to make it easier to bill for mileage. We had gone over this a little bit in the roundtables, and so now we're going to show what we finalized. And these are issues one and four. Slide, please. Okay, so in our revised mileage requirements, I'll show you examples of the new forms in a moment, and we will send you that template with the notice to proceed email as well. 
We've removed the tire counts. So tire counts um, will be reported only on the progress report. And we've also removed time in and time out. You may use your agency's mileage form if it has the same information that we are requesting on the Cal Recycle form. Again, be forewarned that Cal Recycle auditors will request the vehicle logs to back up your invoice. There must be detailed vehicle logs that can be used to verify any mileage charges submitted for reimbursement. Yoli? Yes. Are the new forms um, on GMS for TEA 29? I will have to double check on that. Thank you. Because I have a request to make sure they're on there. Um, please explain further detailed logs. So whatever you submit to Cal Recycle uh, for a mileage log, you'll just want to make sure that you have the backup and the ability to prove those miles um, that you are requesting reimbursement for during an audit. And I'll get into a little bit more of that when I show you the examples as well. So again, you may use Cal Recycle provided mileage log. You may use your agency's log if it has that information that's on the Cal Recycle log. And you can maintain the vehicle log showing daily miles and purposes for audit, or yeah, for audit purposes. The log submitted with the invoice is not sufficient backup to the mileage charges for auditors. So what you are giving grant managers will not be sufficient for an audit. And I'll show you um, what I mean, and I'll provide further detail in the next couple of slides. Slide yeah, that, the exception to that would be if, if they're providing us their logs, um, then it, it might be sufficient for auditors. Um, because it may have more information than, than what we're requesting. That's the true. log, yeah, the cow recycle logs alone have less information than you would actually keep in a, in a log that you keep in the car. Um, and so those, those are the ones you need to keep for audit purposes later. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Derek. So big change from the previous cycles. On the same log now, you can record for vehicles that are shared use or dedicated only to T. So there, on one part will be shared use, the other part will be dedicated. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. Again, remember to keep detailed records that backs up what you are providing to CowerCycle when seeking reimbursement. As you can see, this log asks for less information than what an audit will ask for. So um, you'll need to be able to provide your own records that contains information such as, but not necessarily limited to, specific dates like April 4th, 2022, destination, mileage beginning and end, and purpose. So when we talked to audits, this is the information that they had uh, let us know that they would be looking for when they're looking for back up to this type of mileage log. Again, specific dates, destination, mileage beginning and end, and purpose. Slide, please. Okay. And then we have dedicated vehicles, so vehicles that are used only for T purposes. In this case, you would select the month using a drop-down menu and then enter in the vehicle information, then the miles and the rate and cost and rate and cost will only be on the EIS. The purpose column on both the shared and the dedicated pages are drop-down menus. So you can click on the drop-down menu to select from, and in this case, uh, you're selecting the primary purpose. So the main use of that month's trip. If it was mainly inspections with some training, maybe some enforcement, just put in inspections because that was the bulk of it. And your own records should keep, that you keep, should have the specific and more in-depth details as mentioned before for audit purposes. And then at the bottom, it will automatically calculate the total miles. When you're using the shared vehicles portion, 
So Dirk, if you could go back real quick. Um, the purpose again is a drop down, and so for each one, um, instead of it being a bulk reason, it should be a specific reason for that date and miles. Yoli, when you say shared. Does that mean that the county car is used for other programs as well? That is correct. It means when a car, a car can be a personal vehicle, it can be an agency vehicle that is used for other programs. It is not a vehicle that is solely for T purposes only. Thank you. Oh, why two different logs? Two different logs on the same worksheet or on the same Excel um workbook so you won't be getting two different workbooks you'll get one workbook and you'll use the one that you need either for shared use or for dedicated vehicles that's so we, oh sorry i was just gonna say that's why um it looks like there's two of them it's all in the same workbook and this is to help make it easier for not having to chase down different um workbooks okay next question so we will still need to keep the most so we will still need to keep most of the same information as the old form for audit purposes right but you if you use these logs that cover cycle provides then you'll need to keep more detailed information if you submit logs that have those specific dates, destinations, mileage, beginning and end, and purpose, then that could be sufficient for audits. Okay. Um, sorry, miles is, miles, is that just a total for the day with each line only being one day? Yes, a total for the day. As you can see here on the shared use portion, it's the date, the miles you did that date, and the purpose. We can log and submit one workbook, which will work for both audit and reimbursement purposes. You can submit a more detailed mileage log, yes. The next question is, so how does this actually make it easier for us? There is less information that you need to input when submitting for reimbursement. Our inspectors use their personal vehicles for all inspections. Would we use the shared log form? Yes, that is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Just kidding. So we will, so we can write in the total miles of the trip or beginning and end. In the shared use, you see here, you would write the total miles that you used that day. Is that the same for the other one? And then let's look at the dedicated use. So for that month, it, you would write down the total number of miles that you used that month. And the month column is also a drop down menu to select the month from. So this isn't by person or is it? Dedicated vehicle portion is by vehicle. It is not by person because it is a vehicle that is used only for T. And you would input the month, the vehicle make and model, the vehicle year, vehicle VIN number, and then the total miles that that vehicle did for T. And then of course, primary purpose. Can we continue to use the same log as we had used for the TEA 28 and that will work for audit purposes? I believe so. But they still need to turn in this one for TEA 29 and their payment request, right? For T29, you can submit the Cal Recycle provided mileage log or your own agency log or um, the T28 mileage log because that one does have more detailed information.
what we are looking for is the information that is provided on the T29 mileage logs. So whatever you end up submitting, as long as it has this information, it will be acceptable for reimbursement. If you want to submit something that is acceptable also for audits, then you will need to have thing, information that is more detailed, such as the date, destination, mileage beginning and end, and purpose. So Darren asks, please explain again what will be needed during an audit. She just did, thank you. Okay, I wasn't sure. Okay. <laughs> and if at any point in time, you would like to talk offline with me, by all means, we can do so. Okay, that was the next last question for now. Okay. Let's go ahead and continue then. So for payment requests and supporting documentation, you do not need to um, provide original copies. So the grantee must upload the invoice documentation to the payment request tab in GMS. The completed uh, payment request, which is Cal Recycle Form 87 signed by an authorized signatory. Those can be digitally signed, which is what I meant earlier by, you don't need to submit an original wet signature copy. And then of course you want to keep your supporting documents, keep those originals in your files. There are two invoices um, to be submitted in the year, which is the mid-year and the final. The mid-year will be from June 30th to December 31st. The final, which is the performance period is January 1st to June 29th. So the performance period is June 30th to June 29th. Of the following year. Then report writing starts from June 30th through September 30th of that year. When you are submitting your final payment request, you want to ensure that your performance actions go up until June 29th. After June 29th, that is starting on June 30th, everything after that should only be related to reporting, report writing. Slide, please. Okay. So for invoice documentation, the required forms and documentation are Form 87, which is the grant payment request form, a mileage log, the progress report, and I'll get into that a little more later, the expenditure itemization summary, which is the EIS, the hourly rate document, and then any invoices, receipts, or other proofs of payment for equipment purchases of 500 or more, and then any certificates of completion if you do training and the travel itemization form, form 246, only when you are charging for travel. If you're not charging for travel, you don't need to worry about that form. What is not required are the personal expenditure summary forms, that is the PESs, the field patrolling form 229, and the inspection log, also known as the prior, priority inspection work plan. Slide, please. This is just to show what the grant payment request form, that is Form 87, looks like. What you see here is page one. There are four pages total, with the last two being instructions on how to fill it out. When submitting this request, fill everything out that you see here on page one. But please be sure uh, that the grantee name and address match what is on the grant agreement. When you submit the form, ensure that at least pages one and two are submitted. How is EIS different from PES? The PESs were used as backup to the EIS. So when you had on the EIS administrative costs, you would have a corresponding document, the personnel, um, expenditure summary, 
that detailed everything for that summary of the EIS. So think of the PES as the detail and the EIS as the summary of the hours and the folks that were involved or the staff. So the EIS is required, the PES is not. Did that help or? Someone said those PES were too much time consuming. Glad it's not required. That's good to know. Thank yeah. you for that feedback. Also, Yuli, are you done talking about the 87? Because I just wanted to add that make sure you don't lock. When you're signing it, don't lock it because we can't fill it out our portion if you lock the Adobe sign. Good point. Thank you, Renee. You're welcome. That's it for questions right now. Okay, then let's go ahead and continue. Speaking of the EIS, <laughs> there are no changes to the form. All personnel hours are entered with the name and the hourly rate of the employee. All time associated to the inspection is on there. So again, you're not needing to submit the inspection log. It Everything goes in there. All your hours for anything related to inspections now only goes on the EIS. That includes reports, research, all those things. Completed inspections are entered into W2MS and they need to be approved as eligible for payment by the liaison. So that summary of hours that is on the EIS, again, grant managers will be checking on WTMS to make sure that those are all eligible for the inspections that were conducted. Okay. Next slide, please. This is what the EIS looks like. Again, there are no changes to it. Everything is on here and you can see that it's just a summary of your hours and the total, the subtotal at the bottom will total up automatically what the dollar amounts are. Make sure that the hourly rate on the EIS matches the hourly rate document. Slide please. And then this is the other part of it since the whole thing doesn't fit on one slide. And then at the bottom, um, please be sure that the amount entered into GMS matches what is showing here on the EIS. I know sometimes um, that the amount requested sometimes will differ from the amount entered in GMS and that's okay. Um, as long as what is entered in GMS ultimately matches what is here on the EIS. Slide, please. So remember that when you have payments or purchases that are 500 or more, you need to have proof of payment. And um, those includes receipts, invoices, cancel checks, things like that. Um, you wanna have documents that show the vendor name, the address, purchase amount and date. And if the grantee is only claiming a portion of the invoice, the amount billed to the grant should be highlighted. And let's go to the next slide and show an example of that. So here's a full invoice for a purchase. And you can see in the red box, uh, the last red box, how the total amount is 34,530 and 80 cents. So we're, we're going to have a grantee that that purchased something, but they're not going to charge this total amount to the T grant. So next slide, please. So what you want to do is you'll highlight that total amount and then highlight how much you are charging to the T program as shown in the very bottom red box. So of this 34,000 that's being charged um, on this invoice, only 2037 is being charged to the T program. You can just handwrite it on there and uh, highlight it to help grant managers find it. Slide, please. Um, Jim made the comment, remind that they need to submit three bids for equipment purchases, but that's just if they're over 5,000, correct? 
I believe so. Mm -hmm. yeah. So please, if you, and if, if you have that kind of a large purchase, also talk with your grant manager as well. Thank you. Keep going. All right. So uh, the travel expense log, if, if there's any travel, you'll want to make sure that you have the training certificates, the agendas or itineraries um, for any meetings, the airline invoice, and um, the next slide will show an example of a hotel invoice showing a zero balance. So let's go ahead to that one. Uh, okay, that wasn't the next one. I think it's the one after. But before we go to that one, here on the travel expense log form, this is how you would fill it out, for example. And at the bottom, you see uh, where it's total daily expenses is 550. You'll want to make sure that it matches with the EIS under lodging and meals. You'll see that it matches with the 550 there. So these two documents will need to match if you submit a travel expense log form. Okay, slide, please. Here we go. All right, here is a hotel receipt. And you'll see at the very bottom that the balance is zero. This shows that it's been paid for because we only reimburse for expenses incurred and not for expenses in advance. So you'll need to have paid for it already. And then that is part and parcel of requesting a reimbursement. Slide, please. Wait, would the training certs and agenda be required for the Cal Recycle trainings? Example, the TTS, if it is in person. You do want to provide backup documentation for trainings that you have received. So when you are going to TTS, that is receiving training. And it, it does go into the training portion of the EIS. Therefore, you do want to provide the um, agenda or itinerary of that training to show that you went and that it is T related. Will there be a conference in person for TEA 29? That I have no idea. Maybe Derek might know. Uh, we have not heard yet. Uh, we think that the next TTS will be in person, um, but it will likely not be in T29. I think it's scheduled at this point for the fall of 2023 which would be in t30 so i don't think uh, because we just had when they're usually every year and a half so i think it's supposed to be in the fall of 2023 and at least tentatively they're hoping to have it in person but we'll see what happens with the virus thank you Derek. okay okay so when you're you're requesting travel reimbursement, be sure to check this link provided here that you see on the screen to know what is the most current eligible amounts for lodging, transportation, and meals. Next slide, please. Okay, here's an example of how you would fill out the travel in information on the AS. So you have the staff person, their hourly rate, and the hours that they did their training. It totals automatically on the right-hand side under dollar amount. And then lodging and meals, again, that amount needs to match what is on the travel expense form. And then the miles, uh, excuse me, the transportation, um, any transportation that you go, if, well, if we had it in person, um, that would also be included on the EIS. Slide, please. All right, now let's have a look at the process for submitting your payment request into GMS. So after you log in, you'll land on the GMS homepage. You'll click on the grant management button to access the administrative portion of the grant. 
which um, you see here. I'm not sure if a red box will show, but let's try it and see. Maybe not. Okay. Oh, there it is. So you find your grant, you look at grant management, that is a hyperlink, and you click on that link. Next. There you go. Thank you. So when you've clicked on your grant under the grant management, you're you will first land on the summary page. Click on the payment request tab and it will take you to the page you see on the screen where all of your transactions and summaries are. The little blue numbers are links to that specific transaction. And click on that number and link to access the details for that transaction. So for example, if you start a payment request and then you leave it to you know, do something else and you want to come back to it, then you will click on that transaction number hyperlink in order to um, go back to it and finish it. Next slide, please. But you are not done until you have submitted the transaction. So after you click on it, if you think you've clicked on it and you want to be sure that you've clicked on it, make sure to go back to the payment request page and check that the status shows as submitted. So number one, select the appropriate payment type, break down your request by the subcategory and fund. And so admin, training, operational cost, et cetera, save. Upload all your supporting payment request documents and then submit your request. Make sure to hit that button. If the button is inactive, if it is grayed out, that means that the required documents have not been uploaded. So for example, if you're putting it together, you're ready, you hit submit, but realize that you can't, Something that was required was not submitted and therefore you will need to submit it before um, that button is in a clickable format. When everything is put in, it will show up as the black lettering and then you will be able to click it and submit it. Again, double check that the status shows as submitted and not as pending. If it is pending, it has not been submitted successfully. Slide, please. And let's go back real quick. I also want to add that it's the other part of this is that when you click the submit button, your grant manager will receive an email notification and letting them know that it was submitted. So that's another reason why it is important to make sure that it submits successfully. Uh, we now have a video tutorial to further illustrate this process. Okay, I'm gonna have to do that a little later. I can't get out of this screen. <laughs> so can we yeah. just continue? Yeah, for sure. Is it new share, Derek? I don't know, let's continue and I'll, I'll look around here. I'll figure it out. Oh, I have a question. Uh, how many T's were audited in the last few years? Why were they audited? Derek, can I turn that to you? Um, audits are uh, generally chosen. Uh, it's, it's sort of like if you haven't been audited in a while, uh, we 
we keep track of who's been audited and when, and we just um, we work with audits to identify based on their schedule, their travel schedule, and all of that who's who's coming up for audit. Um, we don't have any uh, like there's no red flags that that are evident in our grantee group, so it's not like there's anybody who's just uh, on a watch list or something. So it's just, it, it's a little bit random, uh, a little bit geographic and, and time-based. Uh, we don't wanna go back and re-audit somebody who's just been audited within the last few years. It's a lot of work for your accounting folks and, and we realize that, so. And there aren't too many done per year. Um, audits has been, um, with, the, with COVID has not been, um, as uh, able to get out and do them. And um, they've also been short staffed over the last few years. So there haven't been as many done. Okay, let's jump into evaluations. Slide please. Okay, so we will still be using the Excel reports that were created last cycle, and there aren't any new changes to those reports. So your activities, your accomplishments, challenges, all of those things will continue to be on the progress report slash final report, which, as many of you know, are within the same workbook. Slide, please. Um, I have a comment. Riverside County has been, I'm guessing, auditive five times over the last 12 years. No specific reason other than the fact that we all are subject to audit. For us, the audit lasted one week. Okay. Um, I don't think that's a cow recycle audit. I think there might have been one cow recycle audit, but um, yeah, I think I think a lot, most jurisdictions have a, a annual required audit um, that you may have to go through. The cow recycle audit is a little different. That's only focused on the grant program um, specifically. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so as you may be familiar with then that the progress report and the final report are within the same workbook. And at the bottom, you'll see all the tabs. Um, the first tab is the instructions, and then it has the mid-year, and then after that will be the final. So remember, if you have a question about how to report your data, just uh, look at the instruction tab, and you can always talk to your grant manager as well. Slide, please. So do fill out the contact information for the report you are working on. And when the report has been completed, have your authorized signatory sign your report and they can use the e-signature function as well. When you are submitting it, remember that you are submitting the signed cover sheet and, uh, excuse me, let me start over. You're submitting the signed cover sheet as a PDF and the rest of the report you'll be submitting as an Excel document. Slide, please. You'll notice that there are some questions here um, and there are more questions on the final report than on the mid-year report. So please, briefly answer the executive summary questions and check the boxes that apply um, for the other programs as well. Slide, please. What happens if an audit finds insufficient data? So uh, in any audit, if there's a uh, if they're unable to validate uh, charges, then that can result in a finding and then having to repay those 
those uh, funds. So if, for example, on mileage, we were billed uh, a bunch of mileage and there was no backup for that mileage, then the auditor could choose to disallow the entire amount charged and the, the county or city would have to repay that, that amount to Cal Recycle. So um, it's, it's important to have backup, whether it's timesheets for personnel showing time spent on the grant or mileage uh, logs that show um, mileage, you know, vehicle mileage spent for, for grant activities. Um, but that's what would happen. There is a time period, Derek, though, where they can provide more information to um, say, oh, no, we have this documentation. Here it is. Right. So they can, I don't know what the word is, like, yeah, uh, or whatever. Or but. Yes, that's correct. Uh, the process is that the, the auditors, uh, I'll just real briefly run through the audit process. So they would, they would send you a letter. Uh, saying that um, they're coming to visit and uh, the dates of the audit. Um, they would work with the uh, people on site to get all the documentation that they need to review. Uh, they would then um, compile a, well, there would be an exit meeting um, giving kind of overall uh, findings of the audit. They would then submit a draft uh, audit report. At that time, grantees would have, uh, I think it's 30 days, might be 60 days, I don't remember off the top of my head, to respond to that draft and to provide any additional information that might have been missing um, if, there were, if there were a finding. And then at the end of the period, either 30 or 60 days, then uh, a, final draft, a final audit report is issued. At that point, the audit is final. Uh, the findings are final, and if if there was any, um, and if there were any findings that resulted in a uh, financial repayment, then then that would have to be made at that point. But um, that's pretty rare. I mean, we've we've done a number of of T audits over the years that I've been working this program, and and jurisdictions do a good job accounting, and they're they're closely audited. They've got they've got qualified accounting people. They've got qualified attorneys uh, overseeing everything. Um, so it's it's rare to come up with findings um, that are significant or or result in a repayment. And that's one reason we do this every year. <laughs> We're trying to keep you out of audit trouble. All right. Thank you. Any more questions, Renee? No, go ahead. Alrighty, so uh, when you fill in the inspection data, please make sure that your information reconciles with your original priority report and the WTMS data management system. If you know of any discrepancies, please contact your grant manager. So for example, here, it says um, number of priority inspections assigned. If you were assigned, say, 100 inspections by Cover Cycle, then that's the number you would enter in. Um, but then let's say, um, for whatever reason, that the number that you completed does not jive with the WTMS report, then you'll want to make sure um, to go back and make sure that those do match up. And if you need help, do ask your grant manager for assistance with that. Slide, please. If you had indicated that you had any training, um, then you'll want to put that into the training tab. And you'll want to make sure that you fill in all the details on this worksheet. And then, um, as far as rate per hours go, again, you just want to make sure that things match up and that the total number, uh, total personnel hours requested 
matches with the total number on the EIS. So for example, if you have um, inspector A who went through a training and their rate is, I don't know, $30 an hour, and they requested um, five hours, then you'll want to make sure that that amount is matching on the EIS. Please do also take note that training hours are capped at eight hours. So uh, that is eight hours a day. So you can have multiple days of training like the TTS, for example, is multiple days. But um, according to the P's and R's, the, it is capped at eight hours a day. Slide, please. So the progress report template will be available on the summary tab, and I will double check to make sure that is in there if it is not currently. And you'll want to upload those completed reports to the reports tab. Slide, please. And before you join the quiz here, uh, just again, when you are submitting your reports, make sure that it's in two parts. One part is the signed PDF cover sheet. The second part is the Excel workbook of the rest of the report. All right, now we have a quiz for you. Please join in, use the QR code or use the slido.com. Okay, we'll give you another minute to uh, make your choice. And yes, the correct answer is the mileage log. None of those other forms are required. Do you need to keep track of time for T activities? Give you just another minute to log your response. By the way, these are anonymous, so <laughs> we don't know who it is that's responding. All right, and the correct answer is yes. You do need to keep track of time for tea activities. And uh, you know, I'm just going to make a little note on this one. Uh, one thing that came to my mind uh, as a way of tracking your tea activities um, that would be auditable is if you don't want to keep it in your time accounting system uh, by TPID, that is, then if you must have schedules that you set up for inspectors, um, uh, routes that they're taking on a daily basis, what TPIDs they're going out to visit, that kind of thing. That would also be an auditable record of, of uh, where people um, actually inspected. So that might be another way and something that you're already doing that you don't have to then repeat. Um, Derek, a, a few people have said that the pop-up closes voting after just a few seconds that it, so they don't have enough time to answer. Oh, and okay. a few people said they can't vote either. Okay, then I will let this one go a little bit longer. Okay. In T29, where do you show inspection time by inspector for the invoice? Closed immediately again. I think it is only letting one person vote. Oh, that's terrible. Let me back up. Also, if training or some other activity is expected to take more than eight hours, training slash roundtable plus travel time, may we ask 
beforehand to charge for overtime? We don't allow overtime in in the grant, unfortunately. The, um, beyond eight hours, we pay up to eight hours. Now, the exception to that is we do have some inspectors in some jurisdictions that only do the uh, inspections in overtime. So they work their regular eight hours and then they charge their tea time as overtime beyond their, their normal duties. That's allowable, but we, we won't pay more than eight hours um, per, per person um, in the T, in the T grant. That's, that's part of the, the rules of the grants, unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever, whichever way you look at it, but that, that's all we pay is eight hours. Okay. I'm sorry that this cut you guys off. I think, uh, at the top there, Derek, it says three out of 29. So maybe three people out of 29, I don't know. Oh, you're right, three out of 29, that's bad. Okay, let me let me go back. Okay, let's try that question again. Maybe, well, I don't know if it'll do it. Oh, well, we'll just move on. The correct answer is the IS. So that's where you're saying. Oh yeah, that's good. Okay, well, they all got it right too. Congratulations. Anyway, we're we're learning how to do this. So um, I'll move on. Uh, Yoli? I have a question. The Conservation Corps is proposing to do cleanup on weekends, but the LEA is not approved for overtime. What can I give the Conservation Corps to authorize them to sign the manifest? That's a good question. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, the Conservation Corps is proposing to do cleanup on weekends, but the LEA is not approved for overtime. What can I give the Conservation Corps to authorize them to sign the manifest? To sign the manifest. So are they, is the question whether they can work on the weekends when the Corps is doing the cleanup? Say that again, Derek. I'm unclear on the question. Is the are they asking if they can work on the weekend as well with the Conservation Corps? No, I. The CCC wants us to sign the manifest when they are working. So it sounds like LEAs don't work on the weekend because that would be overtime for them. But it's not for C, the Conservation Corps. So who would sign the manifest? Well, the the cores are all permitted haulers, so they can sign the manifest. I think that's the question. Does that answer it? Oh, is it Aura, Aura? If I may, this is Jim, yes. if I may jump in. Um, since, since the cores are, are authorized haulers, they have their own manifest. Um, and if they do it on the weekends, if they've coordinated with you, they can do that on their own. Um, and use their own manifest to remove the tires, if that if that works for you. Yeah, we answered. We're good. We answered the question. Thank you. Stacy said that we needed to verify that the number of tires agree. Can you can you um, can you explain a little bit more what you mean there, Ara? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, we have this site that I alluded before, which uh, we believe had less than 500 tires, but as we dig, more tires come up. So because it is in a difficult area to work at, um, the no allocated hours in uh, during the week is not enough for them to remove a significant number. So the CC is proposing to do the work during the weekends. They requested uh, one of us, one of the LEA, to be present at the end of the day to see the number of tires. I agree you know, with them that they removed, um, let's say 200. 
So we then signed the manifest and they give us, um, you know, our copy. But um, you answered today that uh, you don't pay overtime. The policy in the county is if you go beyond your um, required number of hours uh, that you have in agreement with your employer, uh, you have to charge overtime. So uh, hence, we cannot work during the weekend. Um, Conservation Corps wants us to be there. I contacted my liaison and the liaison said that we needed to provide the Conservation Corps a letter approving them to sign on our behalf. Um, so I just wanted to uh, confirm with um, the panel that um, in fact, I need to provide a letter or by just uh, the Conservation Corps working for and uh, having authorization from Cal Recycle, they can sign on by themselves. And so also for the benefit of the other counties. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that question. So, so our, our rule, our policy on this is that we don't pay more than eight hours per day. So I think you know, if you've got something going that you need to be there on the weekend, um, as long as it's not going to be more than eight hours, then I think that we can we can accommodate that. As I said earlier, we already accommodate um, other jurisdictions on paying overtime wages um, to inspectors who are working beyond their normal eight hours that are not charged to T. So. Um, I think we can work with you on that. Just just um, get in touch with your grant manager, and then we will work with you on that. But if we don't we don't want to be in the way of things happening, so just give us a call and and let's talk it through. Okay. Then I have. Hold on. Are are there roundtables planned this cycle? Will they be in person or virtual? I do not know of any that are planned yet this cycle. Um, so I don't know if, if they are going to be planned, whether they'll be in person. So you'll, we'll have to notify you as soon as uh, enforce, our enforcement um, counterparts plan those. Um, we, I know everybody's anxious to get back together in person. Um, so I hope they'll be in person if we have them. But uh, unless somebody from enforcement is on the, the line with informa better information, um, the best I can tell you right now is that we will let you know as soon as we know about that. What happens if an inspection goes long into overtime? Are we to leave the site without completing the inspection slash activity and start over the next working day? I think it's unreasonable for you to have to leave uh, in, in that instance. Uh, you know, just work with us on that. Call your grant manager, explain what's going on. Um, as a rule, we don't want to pay overtime because it breaks our policy. But, I, you know, let's, let's talk about those instances. If there's something extreme that happens and, and causes that to happen. But we we certainly would not expect to see that happening on a regular basis with anybody or, or it won't be allowed. I think that's all I have right now. All right, thanks everyone. Well, I don't think we were able to get the video up. However, there is a link provided um, that will have some of these videos and tutorials to help. So that includes how to submit a payment request, a report, how to update contacts in GMS, and how to upload grant management documents. So if you need um, any assistance with that, you can check out one of these tutorials provided on the link that you see on the screen. Or of course, you can always ask your grant manager um, for that link or for any assistance as well. Slide. Nice. Did you have a question? 
No, I just wanted to add something, but you're not done, so go ahead. No, go ahead, Renee. Looks like it wasn't about that, though. It was kind of a general comment. Do you want me to wait or just go ahead? Um, I guess we can wait then. <laughs> so just a few helpful hints here. Again, please read your grant agreement terms and conditions and the procedures and requirements carefully. Whenever you're in doubt, do ask your grant manager. We are here to help and make sure that things can go as smoothly as possible. You can also ask your an inspector liaison if you have questions about inspections and make sure to record your activities and your personnel time often and just in general keep good detailed records. Slide please. Don't leave money on the table. We want you to be reimbursed for all your eligible expenses within your approved budget. So if you have questions about eligibility, please ask your grant manager. And if you can, please try to ask before <laughs> you have to turn in or submit your uh, repayment request, your reimbursement request. You know, as, as the question comes up throughout the year, you can ask at that point in time. And, you know, your grant managers have the T program, but we also have the Conservation Corps program and the LEA program as well. And so um, when it comes to that time where everybody's submitting their reimbursement requests, it can, you know, get a little crazy when there are a lot of questions about what you can charge and what can't you. So please um, do ask, and we're here to help and ask um, throughout the year as well. So sometimes money is left on the table when you're not charging indirect or admin. Um, and part of that indirect is the space that you use that and Derek had talked about that earlier in this webinar, when you don't charge for mileage and when you don't charge for collaborative meetings that involve T activity. So ask us questions. Um, and we will answer to the best of our abilities. And if we can't answer right away, we will certainly search and find the answer. Do so you, pre do you prefer to have one T grant? Wait, do you prefer to have one TEA contact the grant manager for consistency or is it acceptable for each inspector to reach out with questions? It depends a little bit on the question. If it's an inspection related question from an inspector, then you'll want to reach out to your liaison. Certainly anything that is grant related can be asked of your grant manager. However, um, in accordance with GMS, there is a primary contact. And so typically that is the person that grant managers will reach out to if they have questions. Um, but on the grantee side, certainly anybody can ask the grant manager um, a question. But do if you do though, and if you are not listed as the primary contact in GMS, it's probably a good idea to CC the primary contact just so that they stay in the loop as well in case the grant manager ever asks them and um, you know, they don't become blindsided. So for assistance, your grant manager can help with the budget with any grant admin questions and with reimbursement questions. And then your liaison can help with questions that is in regards to inspections, enforcement and inspection related or enforcement related training. Do we have to submit the tire form and therefore have it as part of an audit if we do not make a mileage reimbursement claim? By tire form, is that what used to be the 229? Maybe the person who asked that could unmute and just uh, restate the question. I'm not sure what, what the tire form would be. Hmm. 
my question in this regards would be, um, so the way our inspectors track mileage, it doesn't meet the way, um, well, this current cycle, we kind of switched it. So we added a different workflow for our inspectors to track their mileage specifically for waste tires. So my question in this regard, regard would be to reduce um, the time that is gonna take our inspectors to track mileage for audit purposes. Can we choose to just not make a mileage claim? Yes, you, you can certainly do that if you, if you prefer. So we wouldn't be required to submit a mileage form either? That's correct. Um, but if you've already got a system in place that meets the requirements of T28, then that will certainly meet the requirements of T29 because we've, we've lowered the, uh, the bar quite a bit. Um, so I'm not sure if you're just finding that that's taking too much time this year. Yes. And, okay. and that's where um, I, I, I think we would like to consider if, um, how long it's taking them to track their mileage is gonna be worth um, making a mileage claim. It's gonna be an internal decision. I was just curious sure. as to if we chose to do that, would that be a possibility or would we still need to submit something um, to Cal Recycle even if we choose not to get a reimbursement? No, if you're, not, if you're not requesting mileage reimbursement, then there's absolutely nothing you need to turn in. Um, and, Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. Already, is keeping track of mileage and filling out the form part of inspection time or admin time? That would likely be admin time. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're right, Yoli. Uh, the only caveat to that is if. If your inspectors are doing that as part of their inspection route, then I would just charge it as part of the inspection time. It's, it's just kind of part of their travel time. So I would say do it wherever it's easiest for you to do. Does, did that help answer the question, Darren? So you could charge it to admin, you can charge it to inspection. Like if you're out on the road, you can certainly do that, uh, charge it to inspection as well. Okay, great. Um, so are there any other questions regarding anything that we have gone over in this webinar? Anything that you'd like to ask or comment on? Any of the grant managers who would like to add anything? I did, Yoli. I just wanted to say that you did a wonderful job um, and you provided a list in like halfway through the training of everything that is needed for the payment request. So, and then you provided an example of each of those items on your list. So for the grantees, I really want them to utilize this and use it while they're filling out their payment request so they can do it accurately and make sure that they give themselves enough time instead of waiting to the last few days and then they can't find everything and then it's an incomplete payment request. So I just thank you for being so thorough. Um, and I just wanted to make sure I, I said that. And also just since I was taking all the questions, a follow-up item, the only thing that we had was to check, check GMS to ensure the docs are up uploaded. Right. Uh, we'll definitely make sure and work with the powers that be <laughs> on GMS to make sure that they are provided. However, they everything is provided in the notice to proceed email. So even if for whatever reason we are not able to ensure that the documents are in GMS, they are in your notice to proceed email. Everything is in there. You can also always ask your grant manager for the documents. 
So, um, and yes, please, everyone, today's webinar does count. Um, you can use this time and charge it to the T29 grant. Any other questions, Renee, that have popped up? Everyone's saying thank you. Slide, please. Here are some helpful web links to the T homepage, tire enforcement, the toolbox, general forms, and which again, we are working with the web webmasters to get those updated um, this past year and continuing Cower Cycle has been going through major overhauls of, of the websites um, and web pages. So just kind of keep an eye on those for any updates and as we continue to work with them to make sure that everything is up there. Yoli, you're, you're going to send the recorded training to review again in a link once it's uploaded to the website, correct? That is correct. Once it is um, up there on the website, then you will be sent a link on how to get to it as well as the slides. Slide, please. All right, our contact information again, I am Yolanda Park, I am the T grant program lead and there's my number and email in case you ever need to reach out to me. Wendy Box is our T evaluation lead. And so she had created the progress report and we're very thankful for that. And if you have any questions in regards to um, maybe, you know, a formula got messed up or something to that effect, you can always ask her as well. Derek Link is our T grant program supervisor. There's his contact information. And if you need to find your contact information for the inspector liaisons, the link is provided there as well. You can always check that out and um, see who your <coughs> liaison uh, contact information and what that is. Slide, please. Thank you everyone for attending. We greatly appreciate it. Again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We hope that this was helpful for you. You will be sent the link in the slides at a later time once everything is rendered and posted. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks everybody for attending. Thank you. Thank you.